How to build a Blackgate's twin steam engine, part 14. Coupling the engines together using a bit of modern technology. First of all, a bit of measuring. If I couple the engines together, like this, side by side, the overall width will be about 8 inches. With the engines in this position, the gap between the crankshaft centres is 9.5 centimetres. You will notice that this series is called How to Build a Blackgate's Twin Steam Engine. And here we have a Blackgate's Twin Steam Engine, just about built. And once these engines are finished, I'm going to sell them on my website and donate the entire proceeds to the Candle Lighters charity. To maximise the application of these engines for any prospective purchaser, I'm trying to do it in such a way so that I can offer two individual Blackgate's Twins or a pair of Blackgate's Twins linked together. And I need to make sure that the way that I link them is bulletproof. Once linked, the power output from these two engines is considerable and it would be ideal for a very large scale tugboat. I'm removing the original flywheels but these will be supplied as part of the sale. I want to see how well they run without the flywheel. And both of these engines run just as well without the flywheels as they do with them. They run very fast without the flywheel but they also run quite slowly without the flywheel which is always the sign of a very good steam engine. I've removed the flywheels because I want to fit some of these. In my lathe chuck at the moment is one of the pulleys for a tooth belt system. Unfortunately the hole in the middle is 6mm, I need it to be quarter of an inch, so I'm going to ream it out to quarter of an inch. But when I fit the pulley into my lathe, and bear in mind generally speaking my Boxford lathe is very accurate, the pulley does not run concentrically, so I changed its position. Try again. And the hole in the centre is still not concentric with the rest of the part. How can this be? This is modern CNC technology. But these parts are very cheap, so I'm going to ream them anyway. And after I've reamed the hole and mounted the part on the engine's crankshaft, if it's still not concentric, I will put it back in the lathe on a mandrel and lightly remachine the external part of the pulley. I bought these pulleys from a local company called Spen Bearings. And I've just phoned Spen Bearings to ask them what's going on. And I'm currently awaiting a phone call back from them. These parts were very cheap, so I'm not really complaining. If I have to remachine these parts to make them accurate when they're fitted to the engine and everything works okay, that's not a bad thing, and I will make a video about it anyway. So I went ahead with the reaming, and now the hole in the centre is exactly a quarter of an inch in diameter. What I'm doing at the moment is just gently filing away the marks left by the original grub screw from the original flywheel. I've also fitted a steel washer on the crankshaft between the gunmetal of the main standard and the aluminium of the pulleys, because I don't know how good a bearing surface aluminium against gunmetal would be. And here are the pulleys fitted to the engine, and it's looking quite good. And here's the same shot, but with the pulley fitted. And now I have some options. I bought some more pulleys, these are smaller ones. And if I use a smaller one for the propeller drive in the centre, it will go faster. Or I can use a large one, which is the same size as the others, so it will go at the same speed as the crankshafts. I use the larger pulleys for two reasons, one being the flywheel effect, and the other reason being there's potentially less friction if the belt has to travel around larger diameter pulleys. So I reamed out a pair of smaller pulleys because I bought three of these, and yes, these weren't concentric either. As I mentioned earlier, owing to the power of these engines, especially when they're coupled together, this heavy-duty coupling method is not very model-like. But this is not important if the engines are fitted inside a large model hull. What is important is the physical strength and reliability of the drive. And tooth belts are good in many applications, like cars, and even my small belt sander uses a tooth belt drive. Time to look at mounting the engine. This is the original base when the engines were designed to be in line with each other, so I've chopped it up on the bandsaw. Now I need to drill some more mounting holes at the other end of the small bases. And I'm getting the position from the first hole, then I turn the part around and drill holes in the other end of it. I must confess I didn't use a centre drill on this occasion, I don't always use centre drills. With the twist drill spinning in the chuck, I lightly tap the piece of brass and this makes a very small centre mark that guides the drill for the rest of the operation. Just like this in fact. And once you've made the small mark with the twist drill in this manner, you can just drill through in a normal way. Generally speaking, I often do things like this just to save time. 
Don't forget, as I've mentioned many times, I'm not an engineer, I'm a musician, so therefore I have a musician's brain. It makes me laugh because some experienced engineers watch these videos and can't wait to have a go at me for doing it wrong, but I really don't care. I get a good end result in a fraction of the time. Besides which, I don't know why these sort of people watch my videos and then make comments about the way I do things and tell me that I'm doing it wrong. I do it the way that I do it, and the videos are designed for beginners. I will spell it out. Beginners. Here's a good tip. Often, I will use a rubber sleeve on a twist drill to show me how far to drill into a piece of metal. I left the rubber sleeve on this particular twist drill and it makes it much more comfortable when I use it as a deburring tool and stops me cutting my fingers. Even though I didn't video the process, I drilled and tapped these pulleys to take 4BA grub screws in order to secure them to the crankshafts. And now that the engines are also fastened to the bases, I can test them. By trial and error, I cut a piece of wood to fit between the engines to tension the belt just as I wanted it to be. Too tight is no good, and too slack is no good either. Insert suitable girlfriend joke here. Both of the engines are running very well until I let go of one of them, and the belt flies off. What I need is a temporary mounting base, and I made one using some scrap pieces of plywood. To get the correct tension of the belt, the distance between the engines needs to be two and one eighth of an inch. Then I mounted both of the engines, one at each side of the spacer. And now the tension of the belt is perfect, and that's important. Even though the belt pulleys didn't look very even, they work okay. So I ran the engine fast and I thought, I wonder how powerful this is. I couldn't stop it by using my finger, mainly because my finger suddenly got very, very hot with the friction. Adopting a more sensible approach, I used a piece of cloth. And even though the engine is not running on that much pressure, it was very difficult to stop it. I turned off the air supply, then it stopped. It's time to make sure it's fully lubricated. So here, as always, I'm over lubricating the engine because it's still running in. And for running in or breaking in, you can never have too much oil. Even though the pulleys still look wobbly, they work okay. This is a smaller pulley because I bought a couple of sets of them. This centre pulley, when I fit the shaft to it, is going to be the main power takeoff to drive a propeller or similar. The bearing for this pulley needs to be substantial, so I'm going to make a special bearing fitting that will be mounted on the centre part of the baseboard. This, of course, is not the final baseboard, this is just a quick mock up to make the engine run. I'll probably use some varnished mahogany for the final baseboard. In this rear shot of the engine, you can see that a couple of the cylinders have been fouled by the rubber piping, but that's still not preventing the engine from running slowly. Some people may be thinking, why have I gone to all this trouble when I could have just used a much larger twin cylinder engine? Well, it's been a bit of an experiment. Four 9 16 of an inch bore cylinders equates to more volume than a Stuart double ten, which has two cylinders that are three quarters of an inch bore. And this very small, powerful engine has the added bonus that it has a low centre of gravity, which is very desirable in a model boat. I received a phone call back from Spen Bearings. Spen Bearings is a very good company to deal with, and the man explained that the flanges are pressed on and they're not pressed on very neatly. So that explains it really. Once I mount these pulleys on a mandrel and just take a light skim all over them, they will run much truer. I'll do that in the next episode, and I also need to start thinking about the piping layout. I'm waiting for two reversing valves to arrive. It's quicker than making them. Why do I need two reversing valves if the engines are ganged together? Well, someone buying the engine may need to split it for a twin prop boat. And the benefit of having directional and speed control individually on both engines could be very useful for rapid manoeuvrability. And that's it for this episode. I'd just like to say thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.